Uh, my name is Michael uh, Leung. I'm the uh, engineering manager uh, at Google. Uh, we also have a, a number of folks from different company. Uh, we have Corey Hartman from Dell, Tim Lambert from Dell, and uh, Arado uh, Astara, and uh, Aurelio Warwickers from Intel. We also have uh, Marshall uh, from Microsoft, and uh, CMAC uh, um, asked question earlier, and myself. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the uh, agenda we're going to do today is we're going to provide some background of the DCMHS and uh, we're going to go over some of the key uh, summary from last uh, uh, release back uh, point seven that uh, we published back in April 2022. Um, and uh, we're also going to also go over some of the uh, latest timeline and uh, some of the uh, different work stream um, a lot of detail from 0.7 to 1.0 uh, we just published uh, recently. And um, lastly, we're going to have uh, uh, um, uh, uh, forward-looking path funding for a number of other things we're looking at and open for questions and discussions. Okay, with that, uh, let me turn it over to Sierra Mac. He can provide some uh, background. Thank you, Michael. Um, well, uh, you guys perhaps have seen some of the work that uh, started many, many years ago uh, as part of recognizing that we needed to work together, come up with modular hardware, uh, hardware solutions, uh, and uh, a, a number of um, teams got together, eventually built uh, things like OAI, Open Accelerator Infrastructure, and DCSCM as uh, individual modules. Uh, since then, a lot of other people and companies have gotten together and come up with a much richer uh, set of solutions. It was important for us to work uh, in an open as part of the OCP because um, individual companies had their own ideas of what the modular system might be, but uh, it came all together when we started to talk about it. And that's part of the open openness as part of uh, uh, OCP. Thanks, so apparently they can't see us if we're act not actually up here. Um, thanks, Malik. So, yeah, you know, a number of years ago, Sialmak and I uh, sat in my office and started solving problems for the data center, uh, <laughs> right? What are, what, what are the pain points for Microsoft? What were the pain points for companies trying to enter our arena, right? Security, management, et cetera. Um, DCMHS is kind of extracting, you know, building upon those issues and trying to get a little bit deeper, trying to go in from just a management security to the system, to the software elements, um, and really, for me, it's all about uh, one collaboration, look, with working with good people from the industry, looking forward to solve the problems in a common way, uh, you know, and two, building those relationships so that you know we understand each other's problems and are and are and are moving in the same direction, because you know every five minutes a new technology is coming along that we're trying to trying to adopt into the industry, and if we're all going in separate directions then we do nobody any good. So very appreciative of the collaboration that we're getting on DCMHS, and I look forward to kind of hearing what you guys say. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so this is uh, the DCMHS uh, mission statement. So um, the, the work group is trying to promote interop uh, between key element of all the uh, data center, edge, cloud, hyperscaler, the infrastructure, providing the uh, major building block, all the interface, all the form factor, right, for, to build a server. Um, we also try to standardize the um, HPM, that's the host processor module, um, different form factor, and supporting all the interop with different platform and, uh, um, and some of the interface, some of the peripheral. Um, let me give you a little bit about the, uh, the current uh, project summary. So we have uh, currently seven uh, uh, leading company uh, working on different work stream. We have AMD, we have Dell, Google, HP, Intel, Meta, and Microsoft. Um, so you can see from here we have uh, CPU vendors, we have uh, uh, enterprise and cloud provider, we also have hyperscaler um, and um, we look at each uh, company, different use case, uh, their design constraint, their different uh, uh, um, boundary conditions, and uh, we look at all this application and deployment complexity, and uh, we come together, we want to promote the uh, industry innovations and, and, and make it more efficient to design a server. Um, and we have uh, six different uh, work stream um, that cover system uh, architectures 
And also, um, we come up with different building blocks, uh, different uh, uh, common uh, interface. So um, with that, we also enable the uh, um, multi-source from different company, from uh, different uh, supplier, because they have uh, the uh, common specification to reference to. So uh, we can make sure the interop between all these uh, company um, can be achieved uh, through the, uh, for DCMHS. Um, Back in the April 2022, we released the first version, 0.7, uh, um, to the public, and um, uh, we got a lot of uh, good feedback. And for the last uh, six months or so, um, we have the uh, 1.0 just uh, released. It's uh, currently in the, um, the committee review and uh, also uh, in the OCP specification link. Um, here is some of the useful link that uh, uh, we present in the uh, April Tech Talk, um, and there's some YouTube video, some presentation you can uh, uh, take a look offline. Um, so uh, we have a uh, six workstream. Um, so from the uh, motherboard design, we have uh, two uh, major work stream. Uh, one is the full width uh, HBM. Uh, we have some picture to show later on. And we also have a density optimized uh, work stream on the uh, HBM. Um, on the high speed uh, IO and PCI specific, we have a XIO work stream. And uh, other peripheral other infrastructure connectivity, we have the MPIC. Uh, so basically um, all the interface, all the uh, infrastructure, we specify on the MPIC. Um, from the power perspective, we have a, um, a CRBS spec. Um, so right now, currently, is, uh, it's a plug-in power supply module. Um, and on the um, uh, interface, we have a one-wire uh, passive interface that also defined in the uh, different uh, work stream. Um, the cartoon picture below is showing different uh, spec uh, release uh, that the work group uh, has uh, worked on. And uh, we just, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we just released uh, 1.0. That's on the uh, uh, OCP specification link. Uh, and um, we'll, uh, we are working on the uh, um, uh, post 1.0 feature. That's uh, other information in the latest part of the slide that you can refer to. OK. Um, so um, we also want to show some of the uh, major uh, building block. Um, if you look at the pictures, right, this is a typical server design. Um, the, on the top uh, uh, right, you see the uh, uh, single socket uh, motherboard design. And uh, the, on the bottom side, you see the um, uh, two socket uh, generic uh, um, um, server design. So they, they have different application, they have different use case, but if you look at the building block, they're all the same, right? Um, if you look at the color code, we put it together, and they, they all have the same element, right? So to build a server, uh, if you use all this work stream, you basically can design the whole server. That's the idea, having the uh, DCMHS coming together and define all the building block. Um, we have a different form factor. The work stream also um, trying to optimize a different right, uh, form factor, different use case, so that we have on the HPM side, we have different form factor. Um, we also define the uh, uh, input power. Um, so far, we focus on the uh, power supply um, uh, module, but we're going to look at some other uh, uh, power input for on. Um, we also define some of the high speed, uh, for example, PCIe, and how do you connect the IO module, and all the infrastructure that you will put on the motherboard, like uh, um, USB, uh, boot drive, um, those are also defined in the um, peripheral um, MPEG uh, spec. Um, so we, the, the, the work group is trying to standardize all this common uh, building block interface, and we also um, uh, work with different uh, component supplier to define, uh, for example, um, the connector, uh, I.O. connector. We also define those. Um, so uh, we're working with other uh, industry uh, component supplier on this too. Um, the other section, uh, uh, we also, if you look at the picture, there's also two uh, interfaces that connect to the uh, DCXM and also the uh, OCP NIC. So um, that's also other sections uh, in the labor of the day you can, you can join. With that, um, let me hand over to um, to Gauri to talk about to talk about the FLW. Thanks. Thanks.
So I'm Corey Hartman with Dell. I'm going to give an overview of the form factor specs and how we progressed from the 0.7 we showed back in April to our 1.0 candidates. So as a quick reminder, the FLW spec is for a full width HPM, uh, you know, to interface into a 19 inch rack uh, chassis or 21 inch. And it defines all the mechanical and system um, interfaces, right, for, uh, for platform future compatibility. And so, you know, what really defined a lot of the journey from 0.7 to 1.0 was we're trying to really flushing out uh, what did platform producers need to be common, what do you need, need to make as requirements to ensure that the, the hardware and the infrastructure that we come out with um, is compatible in the future, um, yet flexible enough to uh, address future technologies, future configurations, future use cases. Um, and at the same time, for HPM designers, for CPU designers, that they had the flexibility in these form factors to meet their future roadmaps and future uh, thoughts and needs. And so uh, we really use that as our guiding principle, is that do we have an enough requirements and compliance defined so that what we build today um, creates an ecosystem for the future, yet it gives us enough flexibility to um, introduce the new technologies that are gonna need multiple generations out. And so lots of discussion and choices were made based on that, you know, what needed to be flexible, what has to be required to accomplish those goals. goals. So in FLW, some of the big notable updates were around the near IO connector requirements. Um, that has a lot of impact on you know, the infrastructure um, or the cabling plans or the IO plans. And so we, we simplified that since the 0.7 spec. And there's also been some refinement in the locations and so uh, that could impact some, you know, uh, I/O and configurations that are possible. Um, but ultimately, we think it's, it's a it's a great improvement in terms of the flexibility um, it provides and the level of configurations that can be delivered. Uh, general refinement in the chassis interfaces uh, around all the other system you know, ingress and egresses. Uh, so you'll you'll you see all those have been basically uh, refined with dimensions and pinouts and, and things of that nature. Um, so that again, a platform uh, provider's uh, infrastructure is is reusable between different HBMs. There was an outline change around the platform custom zone. So in the picture, that's kind of in the in the top middle area, and uh, we think that that's a, a really nice improvement because it enables. Uh, different numbers of OCP uh, NICs, the SFF form factors, or an LFF form factor, or boot device options, all within the same uh, board outline and just a, a HPM designers and chassis designers choice of what to populate. Um, we had a adapted UBB version defined in the 0 0.7 spec, and because the UBB wasn't quite mature at the time of our release here, we have moved that to the supplemental section. And so it's there, and if folks are interested in that, uh, please take a look and provide feedback. Uh, but we are considering future derivatives or future board types for the FLW, and once we figure out that strategy post 1.0, uh, we'll figure out the best way to, uh, to, to bring in those, that set of derivatives. And the other thing that we uh, added a lot of implementer notes to both, both FLW and DNO specs, and that was to try to provide insight or guidance to designers on why certain things were called out as requirements or why certain things were left flexible. And to, to make sure that, you know, in cases where an HPM designer is maybe has a design asynchronous from a, from a platform design, that they know what, it, what, what they're impacting from some of the choices that they're making and who they need to talk to um, or what, what the, the implications are. So we think that those implementer notes will help uh, smooth out any friction points um, for designers. If you go to the next slide, we'll go over the, the DNO spec. So a DNO, it, just as a reminder, is a density optimized, uh, so it has a set of form factors for half width and three quarter width. And so DNO has quite a bit of evolution and change uh, since the 0 0.7. Uh, a lot of the same focus that I just talked about in terms of, you know, trying to find out what's the right level of requirements versus flexibility. And in some cases, these are very dense designs. And so in terms of the HPM design, a lot of, uh, you know, challenges that we had, you know, challenging conversations to figure out what the right answer is. So uh, one of the major updates was the removal of a type one board. That was the, the smallest board uh, in the family. 
And it was really a lack of use cases and applicable designs that the, the work group, after digging into it deeper, just didn't feel that it was appropriate to, uh, to publish that. And so that was pulled and we just kind of tabled the number one and, and started this, uh, the rest of the required types at type two. The other big notable thing is the type three length. Uh, it was changed to a TBD. Uh, the, after the work group started getting toward the finish line, uh, many of the work group just felt like we haven't spent quite enough time on uh, exactly what platforms we're going into, what those platform requirements are, what are the right CPU uh, design type of requirements. And so it just wasn't quite ready. And so we've published it as a TBD, but are definitely uh, looking for, for feedback. And that's something that the team will be focusing on um, as we go uh, forward. Uh, some other changes, the Type 4 outline was updated around the platform custom zone for similar uh, reasons that I mentioned on the FLW. Connector placement zones that hadn't really been identified uh, before in point seven have all been identified for, for all those platform interconnect um, options, you know, control panels and USB and intrusion, uh, things of that nature. And uh, some flexibility has been, uh, you know, debated on, you know, what's the right level of rigor and structure required for mounting holes. And the primary site height restrictions, that's one of those trade-offs, right? Do you have um, a strict enough restrictions to enable a variety of I.O., a variety of thermal solutions, yet still provide enough headroom that a board design can accomplish its you know, power and signal goals? So, so a, lot of, a lot of changes happen there. And in the very next session, some of our colleagues are going to be talking about some usage of DNO concepts. So please stick around for that. Thank you. I'll hand it over to Eduardo. Go ahead. Thank you, Corey. So my name is Eduardo Estrada. I am a system architect working at Intel. So I'm going to talk about the main changes from Rep.7 to 1.0 on the MXIO specification, which as uh, another reminder that we have been giving a lot of reminders lately, it's uh, the modular extensible I.O. on behalf of the leads Javier Laza and Charles Siegler. So the two main uh, changes were on the pinouts, uh, specifically in the uh, form factors 1033, which actually uh, I'm quite excited that it's becoming part of the SNES specification. I believe that is a big deal that such as dense and powerful connector was uh, accepted on, on, this, on that consortium. Um, the changes were basically inspired on to keep it uh, similar to the array or relative locations of the sideband signals and power uh, against the least significant byte. So you can see it on the uh, drawing on the lower right. So um, we are trying to put the least significant byte closer to the power section. Uh, another changes on the uh, specifically the 1016 specification was the relative location of the 3.3 uh, auxiliary. That was part of the feedback that we received uh, from the community to make it uh, similar to the uh, specifications of previous generations legacy pinout. Um, um, besides that, an, another feedback we received was in the amount of the flex IOs that we need to provide or source the connectors. If you think about it, if we need to have so many flex IOs per connector, that explodes the amount of IOs that you need to provide on, on your programmable device. So after some negotiations, we decided to just reduce the amount, um, that mandatory uh, connectivity to the, your programmable device. So that's make it the implementation uh, more friendly. Uh, another item that was um, clarified on the specification was the uh, uh, sequence on the voltages because we have several domains uh, which could be part of the 12 volts on the power supply, um, on the power distribution board, 3.3, uh, 3.3 on the baseboard or HPM, and 3.3 for the management of the connector and 3.3 on the actual paddle card. So all that was tried to be clarified on the specification as well. Uh, another, I, be, I believe, big deal is we are on the works to uh, have the, specific, uh, the pinout that we described on the MXIO as part of the specification 9402. That's going to help a lot uh, to adopt th this new way to interconnect uh, system boards. And finally, um, we are adding as part of a, a, a consolidated source of part numbers, a table for the connectors that we are uh, trying to point the users so we avoid confusion. It's a consolidated single source of uh, information for both MPIC power connectors and MXIO. 
Um, I believe that's all on my side, and I want to pass the mic to Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. As a reminder, the MPIC is the Platform uh, Infrastructure Connectivity Spec. This is basically the one-stop shop for everything that's not part of another standard in terms of all of the entry and exit points of an HPM that are traditionally implemented in proprietary, generic ways, in a lot of cases arbitrary. So um, the, the spec is kind of a miscellaneous place where you'll find a lot of things predominantly do, uh, dominated by the power management functions as well as other miscellaneous pieces. We've, uh, um, the, the main architectural difference here and the motivation is that the HPM, we want to be as generic as possible around the power distribution of other peripheral subsystems. So we have a, um, a what I call a double pick power connector that can split in into two different um, uh, two or more different uh, subsystems. And so you can scale it at different, uh, different levels. There's uh, common uh, sideband signals required and optional, flexible I.O., as Eduardo was saying, uh, as well as you know, requ required uh, in interconnects there to be able to have common ways to uh, manage the power and be able to do discovery and um, uh, peripheral, peripheral management through these interfaces. So there's a double pick power. It's eight... Uh, 864 watt, we've uh, since then created a 432 watt version, which is a single pick power. Uh, then there's also the, what's in the 1033 as a standalone. Uh, it's really a double pick power up to two, 250 watt, but you could independently cable those to different subsystems. It's a very, a bunch of uh, the poster child use case are, are uh, small, smaller Lego pieces and, and risers, uh, single slot chem risers as an, as an example. Um, uh, we're, we're working on the 48 volt that's going to come later. Uh, the intrusion, you know, all the other miscellaneous sorts of things so that you can have some direction of, of common elements. This is not dictating place or quantity or how many instantiations you have, but for any given instantiation, this is exactly uh, how you can count on the hardware uh, having those physical connections. There's some circuitry guidance, definitely pinouts. Uh, and then we're, we're pointing to clearly the synergy with the OCP NIC and the DCSCM 2.0. We've also added a blind mate version uh, for um, you know the power plus the sideband block uh, that'll start to gain a lot of energy through the uh, in a lot of the multi-node and, and different situations coming. There is an analog connector for power distribution management. We understand, as you saw in some of the diagrams, the FLW may have embedded supplies. The, the density optimized clearly always would need a power distribution board. And then you have a lot of different heterogeneous environments where you may need to be feeding, uh, say, a 54-volt plane in your, in your upper U and a 12-volt plane in the other. And how do you manage those things, inclusive of fan-out support for however many pick powers you need to fan out? Um, all of that's been um, um, improved in terms of how exactly we can have common management of a PDB. Um, the, control pa the control panel signals as well. How can we do, as you're going through the different uh, discovery operations, be able to access certain things in certain power states uh, so you can give user indications of what's going on and all of this uh, has been uh, grossly improved. Um, simplified the power distribution, meaning the fundamental thing here is moving the power FETs for peripheral subsystems onto the peripherals so that the HPMs can be as generic as possible and do not need to have a priori knowledge of how much power or the, the specific controls if you need a certain domain and um, off ACPI S5 state or, or that kind of situation. Uh, and then again, we've deferred the 50, uh, the 48 volt is coming. We've just kind of run out of time in terms of the 1.0, but it's clearly uh, next for internal power distribution. Things like PCIe Chem has a 48 volt aux cable variation and other subsystems. Uh, PESTI is the peripheral sideband tunneling interface. This is an optional interface uh, that could be, there's a whole um, Pareto there of, of, it could be a simple presence line all the way up to full plug and play. And in between, there's two phases where you have a discovery pro uh, a protocol uh, phase where you can self-describe elements of the peripheral subsystems uh, from a module class, that kind of thing, to uh, different types of attributes that help you uh, inventory and configure the system accordingly. And then there's an active phase where you're, it's basically a virtual wire tunnel, uh, very akin to the enhanced spy spec that's been out for about seven years. Uh, this is a key 
tool that we're using for all of these different types of interfaces, inclusive of the power supplies itself and uh, control panels, pick powers, and all the MXIOs have this plumbed as an optional way to increase not just uh, the, the capabilities of consolidating the I.O. and be able to help as the, uh, an enabler for things like MXIO, uh, but then also support the fan out capabilities as you're fanning out through a peripheral to however many instances of what you're wanting to do. Um, an average uh, FLW planer would may have up to about 42 of these links, but that's also replacing hundreds and hundreds of signals <laughs> and, uh, and also giving you a path toward uh, discovery mechanisms. Um, we've done a lot of clarifications, added a lot of how you do fan in, fan out guidance. There's a, an interesting aspect when you talk about power distribution boards of understanding it, what we call an any to any combina combination. So you can discover upstream, downstream, and support the fan out accordingly. And one of the big uh, benefits, or the one of the big wins here, is that we're writing this into the PCI base spec as a new uh, ECN chapter that uh, will become the, the core protocol uh, long term. And so, but you know, that's a long process. So we're starting here in the OCP from a 1.0, and we envision as soon as the uh, the next chem. Uh, I'm not Ken, but the base specification in the protocol working group is able to ratify the adoption of this, which is going quite well. Then the OCP piece would be all that stuff that doesn't go into the core hard part protocol, app notes, uh, example discovery algorithms, uh, how do you do some of the fan out capabilities and things of that nature. And I'd like to hand off to Aurelio for power supplies. Hello, I am Aurelio. Um, I am the MCRPS Workstream Lead, along with uh, John Lewis that is here sitting in the public. And uh, when we started this effort, as others here in the DCMHS architecture that we are working on, uh, our goal was to have a common vehicle that everybody can use and reutilize in different platforms. So at the beginning, we had to answer this question. is like, uh, should we create a new power supply with yet a new uh, form factor or can we leverage something that is already existing, right? So we thought that leveraging the Intel CRPS was the best thing to do. So we started working on that, adding the new features that we will need for the next generation of platforms. And as some of you already might know, the CRPS is, has been welcoming the industry and even if you have been here in the expo hall, some of the systems already have some flavor of CRPS in different lengths or form factors or tweaking the uh, output connector, right? So at the beginning, that the specification was uh, the smallest set of requirements needed for an enterprise server. But now that ha we have this traction, we uh, had these companies with the interest uh, to add more features and have something common, right? Uh, so for that, uh, we started uh, describing all the type of inputs that we have in a typical power supply, it's AC, high voltage DC, minus 48 volt or plus 54 volts, for example, to interface uh, with a bus body in a rack, but also the outputs. Uh, as Tim Lambert was saying before, uh, the 48 volts in the HPM was, uh, uh, it's also on hold for the next uh, revision of the architecture. But in the power supply, we already have it because we know there is people using a lot of 48 volts or 54 volts for accelerator trays and things like that, right? So all those specifications are already listed in the MCRPS base specification and you can look at there, right? Also all the type of connectors to commonalize everything. And along the way, we knew that there were some things that we were never going to agree on. Like for example, if an end user is used to certain blinking patterns uh, for faults or warnings events. Um, those are gonna be all the time different, right? So for that, we created something called the configuration file. So in here, you can program how do you want the LEDs to blink depending on the warning, over temperature warning, over, over power, et cetera, right? So, but also all the thresholds that you might have or even options for uh, some protections. Some companies would like to have like uh, in an overcurrent event of the main output, shoot down at latch, but some others might want to retry because there is nobody in the data center, right, to do something like that, to remove the AC cord and put it back again. So all of those things can be programmable. 
and also you can have blocks of data in that configuration file if you need to. So at the end, we create this vehicle and everybody can have their own customizations, not only in firmware, but also in hardware, the finger grip color or the label at work and things like that, right? We also added the firmware attestation, which currently we are using SPDM over PMBus to have attestation and also measurements for all the microcontrollers that a power supply might have. And also the configuration file has a signature for that, right? So we are sure that the configuration as customers that we are providing is the one we want to run in the power supply, right? So also we have the capabilities for regular airflow, reversed airflow. We have also guidelines for acoustics and vibrations in different type of environments like uh, home office or uh, enterprise or also HPC. And if you look at the specification, it's a little bit long, but you can see that everything is there also for reliability and for regulatory. So in the past, we have 250,000 hours of MTBF, for example, now we have 400,000. So all the companies we get, get together, got together uh, to talk about reliability heavily so we can have a very high quality product that everybody can use. So with that, I hope that you can use this uh, MCRPS specification for your products. And thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, so that's the uh, summary from each work stream um, to highlight some of the update from the 0.7 to 1.0. So again, the uh, uh, specification is available for review uh, and feedback are welcome. Um, and um, uh, I, I'm going to uh, summarize a couple of things. Um, so the, it's really exciting to see all this company right, coming together and spend, uh, spend a lot of effort uh, to uh, work on the spec. There's a lot of uh, effort and time spent uh, to 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 come up uh, to the 1.0 uh, spec. Uh, we we believe uh, uh, building um, this spec uh, can uh, and promote the industry um, uh, ecosystem. And uh, you can see right from the uh, from all the work stream, you have a CPU uh, supplier. We have other connector cable uh, vendor we are talking to. We also have. Uh, um, uh, different uh, deployment complexity. You can imagine why right, we have hyperscaler, we have a cloud provider enterprise company. So it's really, really challenging uh, to come to this point. Um, and we also want to promote the consistency. Again, uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, we have a spec out there and all the company, all the supplier, all the vendor they can reference to. So to make sure we have the interoperability. Um, and uh, we also uh, earlier, uh, I already mentioned uh, uh, PSU, and um, we have a lot of engagement with the major leading uh, PSU vendors. So we are seeing a lot of attractions to uh, support the CRPS uh, form factor and the specifications. Um, and uh, we also have the, uh, the um, AVL list available. So um, if any company want to get on to the uh, proof list, uh, um, uh, please contact us. Uh, we have a, a, a mail list you can send to. So we'll do review, we'll uh, make sure you're compliance by these specifications. Um, what's coming? Um, so as you can see, um, the HPM, there's different form factor, single socket, right? You have a, a one inch, three quarter inch, you have full width uh, uh, HPM. And uh, there will be other um, HPM form factor variants that will be coming up. Um, and um, other forum uh, on the open rack, uh, you can see um, also we'll be uh, uh, introducing some other, um, we'll consider um, different rack uh, uh, form factor. How does it affect the, uh, the overall HPM form factor and how does the, uh, the flexible IO and all this module come together? Uh, we'll be also looking at the uh, um, uh, 4860 volt uh, architectures. Um, the current spec is focused on the global going to the uh, um, HBM, but we'll be looking, uh, also looking at the high voltage architectures. Um, we, we will be also um, looking at more detailed um, design guide and the product specifications. Um, so I'm expecting to see more uh, in the coming months. 
And um, previous, so we have a DC stack uh, presentations. Um, so I think uh, on other check, we are also seeing a lot of uh, synergy, right? Um, that uh, collaborations across different uh, uh, work stream. Um, that's another another interesting uh, work stream we are uh, we're working on is the uh, we call shared infrastructure work stream. You can consider this a multi node architecture. So that will be uh, more information coming up. Um, so um, the spec is out there. Uh, One dot already released. Uh, it's uh, it's available for review. Um, so please send your feedback and talk to us. Uh, send us email. Um, all the uh, feedback are welcome. Um, and then also um, think about um, some of the uh, solutions that uh, it's uh, it's applicable to your use case, right? Everyone has different uh, boundary condition, different design parameters. So I think having different solution uh, proposal is very critical, right? To to make sure we are all collaborate together. Um, and then uh, um, yeah, the last one is uh, yeah, send the feedback to the uh, uh, DC images. Uh, we have a link he here. With that, um, I'm open up for questions, feedback. No questions? Uh, one question, uh, I'm from JBO Design Service, and my question is about uh, that how soon or that, uh, uh, is that uh, general purpose server uh, or maybe that uh, uh, hyperscale or the uh, cloud service provider, they will adopt this uh, DC and HS uh, compliance uh, spec and uh, moving forward. Uh, did, you, did, did that uh, committee see the trend so far? Uh, I can start and uh, other folks can chime in. Um, yeah, w I, I, I do see, um, so I, I see it's a progression. Uh, if you look at the work stream, so we have, uh, you know, all the building block pretty much the same for server design, right? Um, um, I, I do expect uh, initially we uh, define all the logical interface is common where you have different work stream. And then uh, we, we, we will see some uh, variance on the uh, form factor because like uh, some um, user may be using single socket, maybe they have a shadow core, they may have a spread core. So I do see some variance of the form factor. The uh, different company are doing different uh, HPM. Um, but I, I do expect some converge. Uh, for example, um, um, we all have a DCSM, right? Um, 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 we have a NIC and then we were talking about the smart NIC and all that. So I, I do expect uh, initially um, all the uh, um, um, interface uh, we can converge, but uh, may have a different form factor. But this is the long-term vision, right? Um, if you look at the motherboard, right, is the um, CPU, DIMM, and then some other people flow like a boot drive and all that. So those are common. So I would expect uh, um, 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 it will converge. Uh, initially, you may see a couple of variant, uh, right, from cloud, from hyperscaler, because um, just you're just looking at the I/O, right? I mean, uh, um, enterprise is the back I/O, and then the hyperscale is the, the front I/O. So you do see some uh, variance, right? But I, I assume um, so over time um, um, we probably will converge. The incubation committee requirement is to list out companies that are committed to product, ultimately. And there are, I think, four or five companies listed in that as part of the package that went to the incubation committee that's being reviewed and voted on now. So there are uh, several companies that committed to this for, I think, 23 products. As well as I'd like to make the point that there's six base specifications here. It's not necessarily all in. You can create products that use one or more of the specifications, such as the power supply, such as the high-speed I.O. versus an, a pure, I'm a DCMHS across the board, may be a subset of you know, product offerings. Because we think these, from a building block perspective, have a, even applications outside of if you care about the uh, HVM form factors that are devised here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I look forward to see more and more uh, DCSH compliance server yeah, coming soon. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the questions.
It, it seems that uh, this was a very large effort and a lot of companies were involved. Uh, I also noticed that there are some competing companies working together. Uh, how did it work? Uh, how did you guys organize your, 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 your meetings, your conversations? How did you debate things? Um, any, any suggestion for the rest of OCP community how to work? Arado, maybe uh, Aurelio, Gus can, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, when we started the meetings, you know, of course we were arguing a little bit for different features and things like that, but what I proposed was to, instead of arguing to removing things or I don't want this or that, is just make everything an addition to the specification instead of removing features. And also come to the meetings with uh, new ideas and solutions for those ideas or proposals. Not, not only the proposal, but also have some sort of simulation, circuit, flow diagrams, etc. So everybody can understand the idea and say, yes, I want this, you know, in, in my power supply, for example. That was uh, really important for us and to understand also that we might not have 100% agreement. So we created this, you know, relief valve called the configuration file where we throw these small pieces that are very important for certain companies, right? So always having that area to relieve the pressure is pretty valuable for the, um, at least for the MCRPS work stream. Mike. Yeah, and from my perspective, uh, it started with aligning the participants to a common vision, right? We all had, you were know, going down complexity sprawl, um, you know, we want to serve more customers, uh, but we had to focus our investments. And so uh, that, that was the first step to say everybody could see the vision of how this could help us all accomplish our goals and serve our customers, right? And so um, that was the, the first step of um, understanding this is the point we need to get to. Um, and then having those negotiations, like in, in the form factor examples I gave of here's what's absolutely required that we need to to, to build common building blocks and we'll, we'll give on these items, but leave flexibility here. Um, but I, the, the most, the biggest aspect is full buy-in on the vision from, from your participants. That's, that was the first step. I, I found it delightful. You think you're of frenemies and enemies, but it was along with those goals, it was very good. You look at something like the SFF 1033 connector uh, was eye-opening when everyone came in with an open eye, uh, open mind of, okay, this really is four connectors in one, and how you do the bifurcatability, and, the end, and you saw, all of a sudden you look up and say, this is going to reduce my cable count significantly, because I can do a lot of reuse and not fewer Y cables, that kind of thing, as well as the integrated power, you know, a lot of the simplifications within the systems, and that was something that, you know, we, you know, initially, no way, and then, okay, everyone kind of changed their perspective and said, yeah, this is a win-win for all, and this is a wonderful uh, building block, so it's gone pretty well. Uh, very good. Uh, it seems that based on what you guys have done, you've created a very nice, uh, comprehensive base specification. And as just our Ariel mentioned, it includes a lot of things and allows flexibility for innovation. Um, as part of the next step, as, as uh, part of um, OCP uh, contribution process, um, we've talked about a base specification and then a design specification to uh, tighten some of these uh, requirements. So um, any plans you have for a design specification? Um, do you want to invite um, the community over here to join and um, tighten some of these specs towards a product eventually? Yeah, definitely. I believe that going into the next level of details is going to uh, promote in more innovation and more collaboration. Uh, we are uh, working on interconnecting now the HPM to other ingredients, and that's where the actually surprises or new challenges are going to be surfacing. So definitely, if we could have more people, more uh, uh, engineers helping us and joining in this effort, we could solve those and have a better products for our customers. As well as internal and external uh, you know, perceptions of what is the sunk cost and what it should be commoditizable. When you think about an HPM and silicon diversity goals out there, 
the core competency, I mean, the core of it absolutely is NDA, unique, that kind of thing. But do does a CPU vendor creating a reference board really care about how someone does their control panels? So we think those are the sorts of things that are being able to be commoditizable here and looking even internal culture-wise you're saying, okay, this is just how we do it. I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to be rigid, and, or, uh, you know, I don't want to be flexible here. And then these are the types of things that we think are the building blocks that help people kind of break through thinking, where you can still do a plug and code model and move toward a plug and play model in terms of the hardware interop. We are starting with exactly what CMIC said on the DCSEM interfaces for different types of markets where you can have, let's commoditize all this management stuff because you're not real, you may not be getting real value add about an interconnection for a miscellaneous sideband bus. So that, that's the, the thing that, it, you know, was my big takeaway from changing culture, the cultural thoughts. Uh, how much time and energy did you guys put into this? How many meetings a week did you have to actually make this happen? It seems that the concept started perhaps last year when we had the uh, OCP summit in November the ideas just came together and multiple companies wanted to work together, but how often did you have to meet, how many hours did you spend to eventually produce the spec uh, by now, one year? I think uh, typical each workshop, uh, we have a single meeting every week, um, and but a lot of uh, hours uh, behind the scene try, we, uh, um, different company, they are uh, talking to different uh, vendors, uh, connector internally, uh, they have a lot of discussions, right? Um, even, the, uh, for example, on the foot drive, right, just an example, right, so are you using the way? are you using the MME, are you using SADA, so there's a lot of this discussion to right, across different companies, I think in the background, um, um, many people are spending cycles and effort. Uh, I, I'm really, um, I'm really happy and uh, it's exciting to see, right, the collaboration across different company and the effort uh, um, the company is spending, and uh, a lot of expertise, right, from different teams from across the industry. Um, and, and just to echo right, um, the, the previous question regarding the, uh, the specification design, I do expect um, there will be uh, some product coming out right, in the near future because right now you have a spec out there. Uh, a lot of JDM, a lot of uh, um, company, they have uh, some reference they can design. And uh, we, we do expect a lot of feedbacks and a lot of challenges, right? Because you we expect we see problems, we see conflict, but uh, I think the team is committed to resolve those. Yeah, I think we had at least three meetings a week in the form factor uh, work groups um, since the beginning of the year and a lot of homework before that to start with some seed specs and some seed ideas just to start the conversations and a lot of great collaboration offline lots of time spent offline where a couple companies would get together to go work out an idea and then bring it back and then somebody else would volunteer and so it's just fantastic collaboration amongst the group um, and a lot of time has been invested definitely from all from our parties. So, so, so how many people were involved then? Uh, it seems that there's a lot of uh, going back and forth. How many people were part of the team? I think the reflector, when you email that, will go to about 64 people from seven companies. Okay, um, last questions, any? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.